Before a modern military, an aircraft carrier is the ultimate weapon. It not only amplifies a nation's ability to project power far from its shores, but also serves as a potent deterrent, ensuring stability and peace by dissuading potential adversaries from escalating conflicts. Their strategic versatility and unmatched force projection make them indispensable assets in contemporary naval warfare. Currently, only nine nations on Earth operate these formidable machines. The US, UK, Russia, France, Spain, Italy, Japan, India, and China. The case of the latter nation there, China, is actually particularly interesting, with the nation's carrier development being an almost textbook example of how to successfully develop advanced military technologies free from blunders and cock-ups, which is uh, a rare change of form for uh, things we feature on this channel. But how they achieved this is nothing short of fascinating, because rather than trying to run before they could walk, as they largely had done during Mao's time, China instead unlocked the secrets of aircraft carriers by planning really, really far into the future, laying down a 40 plus year and counting time frame in which they developed the ships. So today we're going to bring you this full fascinating story. So let's get right into it. Now, the People's Liberation Army, PLAN, which is actually the Chinese Navy, first began seriously considering aircraft carrier development in the late 1970s. But crucially, they recognized that at that point, such a vast and complicated machine was simply beyond their capabilities to produce, and so they set out to procure some learning aids from other countries, namely other aircraft carriers that they could strip down and uh, just take the secrets from. The opportunity to procure such a ship finally came in February 1985 when they purchased the decommissioned HMAS Melbourne from the Australian Navy. Now, officially, the Melbourne was sold to the China United Shipbuilding Company to be dismantled for scrap. And, as you might expect, before it was handed over, the Australians made sure to strip the vessel of all of its electronics and weapons, even going to the extent of welding the rudders to ensure that the ship wouldn't see naval action again. But. Perhaps short-sightedly, they left the steam catapult, arresting equipment, and the mirror landing system untouched, the very equipment that the plan needed to get their hands on. Just before we continue with today's video, let me tell you about its fantastic sponsor, Keeps. Now look, I might not be using Keeps personally, but I know firsthand how hair loss can affect someone. <laughs> Could you tell? Look, I totally would have used Keeps, but I just lost my hair before Keeps was a thing. Keeps is all about convenience. You can talk to a hair loss expert without leaving your comfort zone. Their treatment plans are personalized, discreetly delivered, and they're super affordable. You complete a quick online consultation and they'll hook you up with a tailored treatment plan. The cool thing, you could choose delivery options that suit your schedule. Three, six, or 12 months. Keeps offers clinically proven treatment. Look, I can't benefit from them myself, but you might. FDA approved, 90% effective at treating hair loss, and they've also got this two-in-one fantastic gel for your hair, which you'll soon have. <laughs> Most customers see results within six months. And speaking of success, Keeps has helped nearly one million guys keep their hair. Over 4,500 five-star reviews with impressive before and after photos. These are real customers with real results. So go to keeps.com slash megaprojects or click the link in the description below. That's k-e-e-p-s dot com slash megaprojects. Hair loss stops with Keeps and now back to today's video. And so, when the Melbourne finally reached Chinese shores on the 13th of June, it did not face the immediate fate of dismantling. Instead, a group of plan officers were waiting for it at the port with a letter signed by President Li Jinyan himself permitting them to take what they needed. Interestingly, this move was not premeditated, with Rear Admiral Zhang Zhaozhong confirming that the plan wasn't aware of the Melbourne's acquisition until it was spotted off the horizon of the coast of Guangzhou. But they certainly had no intention of letting such a good opportunity go to waste, and so the plan arranged for the removal and in-depth study of the ship's flight deck and all related flying operational equipment before returning it back to the United Shipbuilding Company. In a testament to their rapidly evolving expertise, by April 1987, Chinese engineers had reverse-engineered a replica of the steam catapult and landing system taken from the Melbourne. In the same month, a J-8 jet fighter was deployed for takeoff and landing trials on this land-based deck. The information and practical experience garnered from these exercises proved invaluable and significantly informed the development of China's first dedicated carrier fighter, the J-15. 
Interestingly here, rumors even suggested that the plan approached the Royal Australian Navy for the blueprints of the steam catapult, a request that was diplomatically declined. The bow in itself, contrary to its intended fate, remained largely intact for many years, with some sources suggesting that it wasn't fully dismantled until 2002. Now, this phase of acquisition, study, and replication can be viewed as the bedrock of China's walking before running approach. The Melbourne, rather than being reduced to mere scraps, served as a seriously valuable learning tool. Through patient observation, study, and practical application, China embarked on a journey that would later see them craft their naval aviation future. It should also be noted that while the Melbourne was pivotal, it wasn't China's only acquisition attempt. They also initiated negotiations with Spain for the blueprints of proposed takeoff slash landing ships and even considered purchasing the retired French aircraft carrier Clemenceau. China also acquired two Soviet Kiev class aircraft carriers, the Minsk in 1995 and the Kiev in 2000. Both were sold to be scrapped, and you probably won't be surprised to learn that neither ship met that fate. What might surprise you, however, is that neither ship was pulled apart by the plan as the Melbourne had been before them. Instead, they were both converted into keystone attractions in military theme parks across China. We bet you weren't expecting that one. And so, with a firm grasp of aircraft carrier design now acquired, the next step for China was to find a half-finished carrier that they could finish themselves, and in doing so, they turned all of their theoretical experience into practical experience. Fortunately for China, just such a ship existed. The Kiev-class Variag, originally conceived as a Kuznetsov-class carrier, the Soviet Union began constructing the Variag in the late 1980s. However, the collapse of the country in 1991 left the vessel in an incomplete state, with newly independent Ukraine having neither the resources nor the inclination to complete it. China, naturally, was quite keen to take the very ag off Ukraine's hands, and a deal was finally shaken on in 2002, with the very ag arriving in China shortly thereafter. And at this point, you probably might be wondering, well, why didn't China just use the Minsk or the Kiev, given the fact that they had already got them, and they were the exact same ship class? And to be honest, well, I'm also wondering that too. Van has never fully explained the rationale for that choice. We're <laughs> sorry to disappoint you with absolutely no answer here. But look, whatever the reason, upon arriving in China, the Variag underwent extensive refurbishments. It required a blend of the past experience sourced from the Melbourne and new innovations to transform the vessel from an outdated Soviet hulk into a modern Chinese marvel. The finishing work was completed in 2011 by Dalian Shipbuilding Company and commissioned by the plan on the 25th of September 2012, where it was also given a new name, the Type 001 Liaoning. As a stobar, that's short takeoff but arrested recovery aircraft carrier, the Liaoning has a displacement ranging from 43,000 tons light to 60,900 tons fully loaded. Measuring 306 meters overall in length and with a width of 74 meters, the vessel is powered by steam turbines backed by eight boilers. This provides it with a top speed of 32 knots and allows it to traverse a range of 3,850 nautical miles at full speed and the ability to remain operational for 45 days consecutively. For defense, the Yao Ning is equipped with three Type 1130 close-in weapon systems and three HQ-10 cell missile systems. As for aircraft, the carrier can deploy 24 J-15 fighter jets, 12 Z-18 helicopters, and two Z-9 helicopters. This diverse 38-plane complement allows the Liao Ning to execute a variety of naval air missions. All these specifications and capabilities highlight the Liao Ning's role as a significant asset in China's naval arsenal. The Liaoning's operational capacity leans heavily on its land-based support, particularly in the face of potent forces like the U.S. Navy carrier strike groups. Still, against regional navies such as the Vietnamese and the Philippine navies, the Liaoning showcases a formidable presence. Since 2013, the Liaoning has found its home at the Yuchi Naval Base in Shandong Province, with its presence being regularly observed by foreign powers via satellite imagery. Maintenance and upgrades have been ongoing throughout its life, with a significant refurbishment occurring in 2018 to 2019. These improvements are indicative of China's intention to keep the Liaoning state-of-the-art, combining the old with the very new. 
Training exercises and deployments have been an integral part of the Liaoning's operational history, from initial touch-and-go training with J-15s in 2012 to its extensive drills in the East China Sea in 2022. This vessel has been progressively pushing the boundaries of its operational capacity, even participating in international drills with allied nations such as Russia and South Africa. And so, in the Liaoning, China has found itself with what, by all available information, appears to be a perfectly well-made and functional aircraft carrier. But this is actually just the start of things. The Liaoning was, in practical terms, a final rehearsal, a ship which was largely completed by a foreign power and finished by Chinese engineers trying it out in the real world for the first time. This was certainly commendable, and in completing the Liaoning, China had already accomplished what many nations could only dream of. But for China, this was just the start, with the natural next step being to completely produce an aircraft carrier indigenously from scratch. And, well, that's exactly what they did several years later when they built the Shandong. So, emerging from the shadows of the Liaoning, the Shandong wasn't designed to be just another Type 001. It was meant to be a new and improved design, retaining the strengths of its predecessor but improving upon its limitations, a narrative not just of innovation, but of evolution. Constructed by the Dalian Shipbuilding Company, construction of the Shandong began in March 2013, before finally being launched on the 26th of April 2017. By the 17th of December 2019, sea trials were completed, and it was officially commissioned into active service, with it being dubbed the Type 002 to reflect its improvements over the Liaoning. Since its commissioning, the Shandong has quickly made its mark within the maritime world. The vessel has undertaken numerous naval exercises and drills, not only in regional waters close to the Chinese coastline, but also extending further into the Western Pacific. These exercises have ranged from simple navigational drills to complex joint warfare operations, often involving a fleet of support ships, submarines, and aircraft. Furthermore, the Shandong's voyages have been instrumental in training new crew and pilots, a vital task given the intricacies of carrier-based operations. Like the Liaoning, the Shandong is a stowbar carrier and boasts a displacement ranging from 60,000 to 70,000 tons when fully loaded. With an impressive length of 305 meters and a width spanning 75, the Shandong is powered by conventional steam turbines, granting it a maximum speed of 31 knots. For defensive capabilities, it shares the same armaments as the Liaoning, three Type 11 30 close-in weapon systems and three HQ-10 cell missile systems. Its offensive capabilities, however, are greatly improved, as it's able to hold 44 aircraft as opposed to the 38 of the Liaoning, comprising 32 J-15 fighter jets, 8 Z-18 helicopters, and 4 Z-9 helicopters. Collectively, these specifications demonstrate the overall idea of the Shandong. It's the Liaoning, it's just a little bit better. Another crucial difference between the Shandong and the Liaoning is their ski jumps. The Shandong has a 12-degree angled ski jump compared to the Liaoning's 14. The 12-degree one is optimized for the Shenyang J-15 fighter jet, ensuring more efficient and secure launches, and it is the result of slight inefficiencies in the Liaoning that were only discovered after completion. This meticulous design adjustment is emblematic of China's shift from being mere users of carriers to becoming thoughtful designers attuned to the nuances that can make or break operational effectiveness. For the Shandong, China also separated the bridge and flight control areas into two distinct decks, amplifying operational efficiency and allowing for streamlined command and control operations, another lesson learned from the Liaoning. While the Shandong's specifications and advancements are undoubtedly impressive, what is even more remarkable is the narrative it encapsulates. This vessel is not just a product of China's naval aspirations, but it's a symbol of its journey. Starting with the Liaoning, an external design, China gleaned insights, incorporated lessons, and embarked on crafting the Shandong, a signature emblem of its growing confidence and technical expertise, and a vision that's not content with simply participating, but wishes to lead the pack. So, with the Shandong completed, and seemingly being a perfectly capable ship, what was next for China? Well, that would be staying with their base design, which was, after all, still firmly Soviet despite the vast amount of work put into it by China to modernize it, and try something bigger, better, and entirely their own. The zenith of China's carriers 
for now, is the Type 003 Fujian, which, as you can tell by looking at this photo of it, is clearly just a bit different to its forerunners. More than a mere ship, the Fujian acts as a manifestation of decades of acquired knowledge, unwavering practice, and a readiness to embrace change, laying a solid foundation for a formidable maritime future. So as I just said, the Fujian is an entirely indigenous design, and it's a much bigger deal than you might imagine as well, because through this distinction, the Fujian represents China's firm step away from external reliance, highlighting the nation's growing confidence in its own technological and design prowess. However, arriving at this apex, didn't come without challenges, and Chinese engineers found themselves with numerous hurdles to jump through as the ship ratcheted ever closer to completion. The most major of these hurdles was the Fujian's launch systems. Now, if you recall, previous Chinese carriers employed ski jumps for aircraft launch, but the Fujian was to be different, and it was to achieve what Chinese engineers have been dreaming of ever since they first pulled the Melbourne apart – catapult launches. Initially, steam-powered catapults were considered, but in 2013, Rear Admiral Yin Zhou announced that the plan would be moving towards an electromagnetic launch system. Now, the importance of this shift really can't be overstated, as it brought the Fujian much closer to modern American carrier technology, which is the real gold standard. Given this massive leap in launching technology, you might be surprised to learn that the Fujian is steam-powered like its forerunners, with the Chinese not opting to go with nuclear propulsion for the ship, but do hold that thought for now because we'll get into a bit more of that a little bit later. Construction of the Fujian proper began in March 2015, and of course, with it being such a radical jump from previous designs, challenges were encountered along the way, such as issues with the catapults in 2017 that apparently caused extensive delays to construction. By May of 2020, however, it would appear as though these challenges have been overcome as the Fujian started to take shape at a decent and steady pace. It was finally launched on the 17th of June 2022, and as of the time of recording this video, it's still being fitted out, with 2024 commonly being floated as the year that it's going to enter full frontline service. When fully completed, it's projected that the Fujian will displace almost 100,000 tons, making it significantly heavier than both of its forerunners and inching dangerously close towards the weight of the US Navy's supercarriers. With a current length of 316 meters and a width of 76, it would appear that the Fujian isn't actually going to be that much larger than its predecessors. It's currently unclear exactly how many aircraft the Fujian will hold after its completion, as the plan has yet to formally make any announcement on the matter, but Chinese news sources seem pretty unanimous in believing that it will carry anywhere in the region of 70 to 80 aircraft in total, presumably split around a similar rough ratio of one helicopter for every three fighter jets carried, as seen on the Liao Ning and Shandong, meaning we can reasonably assume that it will carry around 60 aircraft and around 20 helicopters. This is significantly more than its forerunners, of course, but given its much greater displacement and the fact that US supercarriers carry around 80 or so aircraft, this does actually seem like a pretty reasonable number. It also may not be that J-15s find their way onto the deck of the Fujian, as China is currently developing an advanced multi-role stealth fighter akin to the American F-35 in the form of the FC-31, and the designer of which, Sun Kong, seems seems quite enamored with the idea of his baby ending up in carrier service. Were this to be true, it would be a radical upgrade to the Fujian's offensive capabilities, bringing full stealth fighter capabilities to the plan's aviation forces. We don't really know what defensive armaments the Fujian will carry yet either. There's plenty of speculation, of course, but certainly nothing concrete. But. Given what we saw on the Liao Ning and Shandong, you can probably have an educated guess. So, with our overview of the Fujian completed, how does it fit into the walking before they can run narrative that we've been presenting throughout this whole video? Well, clearly, what we have here is the plan, now confident with its successes of the Liao Ning and Shandong, starting to break into a light jog, with just one more little push to break into full run, which segues us rather nicely into this. So, with the Fujian shaping up to be a massive leap forward for the plan, what comes next? And in a word, of course, it's nuclear. Diverging from the conventionally powered Liaoning, Shandong, and Fujian, China's next aircraft carrier, the Type 004, is projected to be the first to be fitted with nuclear propulsion. Nuclear propulsion offers several advantages over conventional propulsion methods. Firstly, nuclear-powered ships can operate for longer durations without the need for refueling, often spanning several decades, an obvious advantage when many of the world's maritime powers take a hostile stance against you and aren't exactly chomping at the bit to let you refuel in their ports. Secondly, the insane power 
power output of a nuclear system would make it much easier for China to fit all of the laser weapons and rail guns that they're currently developing into the ship. This nuclear propulsion, coupled with the Type 004's intended displacement of around 110,000 tons, will make it a true supercarrier, capable of rivaling anything in the US Navy's roster. In terms of aviation, the Type 004 promises unparalleled potency for China. Expected to house between 70 and 100 aircraft, its mainstay is expected to be the advanced FC-31 that we discussed a moment ago, in addition to the usual slew of helicopters and even some KJ-600 airborne early warning and control aircraft, and advanced new type that's currently in development. The strategic developments in China's naval arsenal symbolizes its expanding maritime assertiveness. With the Type 004, the plan is poised to shift the balance of naval aviation power in the Asia-Pacific region significantly. As we've seen, China's carrier program in the past largely focused on learning and adaption, borrowing from the experiences of global naval powers. However, with the completion of the Type 004, if it goes as described, it's safe to say that China will have left those days behind them and will undoubtedly be among the world's great maritime powers, particularly if, as hinted at by the plan, they build four of them. So, having now seen the full story of China's aircraft carrier development, the idea of walking before they can run that we presented right back at the beginning of the video can be seen quite clearly. From humble beginnings, purchasing and retrofitting older carriers, to the innovation seen in the Fujian and the promising future represented by the Type 004, the journey has been marked by prudence, patience, and persistent learning. This step-by-step -step progression has not only allowed them to absorb critical technological nuances, but also serves as a lesson to the world. After all, on this channel alone, how many times have we seen an ambitious project aim for the stars only to crash back down to Earth due to insufficient time and funding? And in the end, just abject humiliation for the nation involved.